Welcome to the 10th message of our series, Live in Grace, which is part two of our study of the life of David. Keep watching as we look at the events surrounding Absalom's revolt against his father. Specifically, we will see what drove David's initial panic and what changed, allowing him to rediscover hope, peace, and his ability to lead. The truth is that our, our, our actions are always an expression of our beliefs. The fact is when we do foolish or sinful things, those are always the result of wrong thinking. Now, even as I state this as a basic truth, I realize that there are probably some people here that will listen to that and say, well, that doesn't seem to, that doesn't sound right. Because usually when we think of our actions, we don't think of an expression of our mind or of our thinking. We often think of it as an expression of our will. You know, so we think of it's an issue of self-discipline that we have to try harder. In fact, we say, well, no, there are times that I don't think it's wrong thinking. There are times that I know that, I, that something was wrong and I chose to do it even though I know it was wrong. But what we have to realize is that why do we choose to do things that are wrong? You see, at that moment, even though we knew it was wrong, we had certain beliefs, the moment that we choose to do something wrong, it's because we believe the promises of that action more than that we believe the promises or warnings or, or you know, the, the, the truth about what God says about that. And so we act on it. We always choose to do that because we believe that's what will make us happiest. But oftentimes, it's a far deeper issue than even understanding the question of, of whose promises do we believe. It's, it's often not a, just an issue of believing the promises of, of, the, of sin, of what that would promise to give to us. But a lot of times, there's a belief that is deep, more deeply rooted. It's, it's a lie about our past. It's something about who we think we are that shapes not only how we think of ourselves, but how we view life and how we then act as a resp response to that. Now, I will acknowledge that sounds like a really deep truth that's hard to understand that some people would say, well, I'm not really sure I agree with that. And, but although it sounds deep, let me show you, in a lot of ways, it's actually very simple. It's a simple truth that a child can understand. And let me illustrate that by showing that it's actually illustrated in, the, in a movie that's a famous children's movie where you see this exact concept play out. One of Disney's most successful animated movies is the classic The Lion King. And uh, it's about this little lion, company, lion cub named Simba, who was the son of the king, Mufasa. And in the movie, Mufasa's brother, Scar, sets up a stampede that kills Mufasa. But then he uses the gullibility of the young child to convince young Simba that he's actually the one who was responsible for the father's death. And let me show you just briefly the scene where this all happens. Simba, what have you done? There were wildebeest and you tried to save me. It was an accident. I, I didn't mean for it to happen. Of course, of course you didn't. No one ever means for these things to happen. But the king is dead. And if it weren't for you, he'd still be alive. What will your mother think? What am I going to do? Run away, Simba. Run. Run away and never return. And that scene sets up really that whole middle part of the movie where he not only runs away, but the rest of his life from there on in up until the, you know, another point where it changes, it's all changed. Everything that he does is different because of what he believes. Because he believes that he's guilty, he runs away, he doesn't take his role as king, you know, he, he lives in you know, this place that you know, rejects all relationships, he rejects his responsibility because he's believed a lie. Now, when we look at that, you say the goal of this morning's message is not to break down the you know, hidden motivations of a fictional uh, animated movie. But it is to understand something about ourselves, our, under, our motivations, and realize that our beliefs, even sometimes our beliefs about, about a lie, false beliefs about ourselves, about events that had happened, how they impact us, and they literally shape our lives, they shape our decisions, they shape our actions. Because unfortunately, like Simba, we too can often have unwise sin or sinful actions that are driven by false beliefs, false understandings, even without us ever realizing 
that where it's all coming from. Now, we are in the middle of the study of the life of David, and, and we're at this section now in, in chapter 15 where we see it's a story that tells us about a really tragic period in his life where his life falls apart. And what, one of the things that we've seen in this study and that we see even more here is that no part of David's life nor any of our lives can ever really be taken in isolation. You know, we can study these by themselves and we can see, you know, how he responds to this. But it's all building on the things that have happened. And what we've seen in really the last month and the chapters right before this is that what has happened is that David has, has made some huge mistakes in his life. And the events that are now playing out are the consequence of the moral compromise of ignored sin and avoided conflict. You know, back about a month ago, we looked at, at uh, David in his sin with Bathsheba, and when we saw the prophet Nathan came and confronted him. And when he confronted him, we saw that it taught a concept of sowing and reaping. Uh, it's a passage, it's an idea that's taught like in Galatians chapter 6. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he will also reap. And, and it's a law because it's something that's always true. It's something that always works out. You know, when you plant a certain kind of seed in due season, what you plant it is what will always grow. You know, you don't plant one thing and then wonder what's going to happen in the harvest season. You know it's always a natural consequence. You never get something totally different than what you planted. And it's a law of nature when it comes to plants, but it's also a spiritual law when it comes to our actions. That when we plant certain actions, we will always receive, you know, uh, harvest, in a sense, or, or reap the consequences of that action. And so when the prophet Nathan confronted David in 2 Samuel 12, before he even gave David the, the chance to confess his sin or deny his sin, he listed not only what David had done, but then he began to list to him also what the consequences would be. And saying, David, because you've done this, you've planted these seeds, and no matter what happens from here, these are the plants that are growing. These are the things that are going to eventually happen to you in your life. Look what it says. I've got here uh, 2 Samuel 12, starting in verse 10. And therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, to be your wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will rise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the sun. Now in the next verse, we're going to see that David then confesses his sin. He repents, and, and we're going to see that in a few minutes and what that means. But what I want you to realize is that he says this even before David responds. And what he's saying is, David, you've got to realize that even if you confess, you've planted certain seeds in your life, and these are the things that are growing. These are the consequences. And the fact of the matter is, is that that's something that's true for all of us. It's something that, that when we make decisions, we've got to realize it's not just the moment right there, but often we're planting seeds that are going to impact us long for, for a significant period of time. And it's not only the decisions that he made with Bathsheba, but he also then made some additional mistakes. And we saw this especially last week, and we saw that the, the idea that there's a truth that wounds that are left untreated will never get better. And for years, there was obvious sin in David's life, and not only David's life, in his family's life. And so you had some incredibly you know, broken things happening of rape and murder and, and anger. And, and what we see is that David doesn't deal with it. He refuses to deal with it. There's obvious anger between family members, and he knows about it, but he doesn't deal with it. He, he just, in a sense, leaves it alone, hoping it's going to go away. But again, what we see is that a wound, just like a physical wound, a deep wound, you leave it alone, it doesn't get better, it just gets infected. And the same thing happens when you're not dealing with sin, when you're not dealing with anger. And so what we now come to is in chapter 7, or chapter 15, is we come to the Absalom, and Absalom has been impacted by this more than anyone else. He's been living with dysfunction for, for really seven years. I mean, first of all, you, he saw his sister being raped, and, and David heard about it and did nothing. And Absalom, his anger grew. And then finally, he said, well, if dad's not going to do anything, I'm going to do anything, something. So he takes it upon himself to murder his brother. And we're told after murdering his brother, there were three years where David basically allowed him to go in exile, and David did nothing. He didn't try to bring justice, but he also didn't try to bring healing. And finally, after three years, he's brought back to Jerusalem, but then David says, well, he can come back, but I'm not going to see him. I don't want to talk to him. And so there was this partial forgiveness that, that you know, the things weren't healed. And again, that you have this wound that isn't addressed, and it keeps getting worse. 
And finally, David brings them before him after two more years, and they, you know, just kind of forgive and forget, which again isn't a biblical concept. It's really bury and ignore. You know, it's not dealing with the issue. It just is, okay, let's just, we'll just agree not to, you know, to forget about it. And because they don't deal with it, it gets worse. And now after those seven years, the Bible tells us that there's four more years that go on. And you have this wound continuing to grow. And what happens now is this undealt with sin, this untreated wound, continues to fester. And so Absalom, who's this natural leader, as he gets angrier and angrier, now begins to take a plan out, you know, or to formulate a plan to somehow get back at his dad. And so one of the things that he, he, we read then as we come to chapter 15 is that he looked for his, one of his dad's weaknesses. And he tried to exploit it. You see, in that time, when you were the king, there weren't three branches of government. In our, in our government, we have the executive or the president and the congress, and, and, and then you have the judicial branch, and they each do part of the work. And that day, the king was all three. That meant that he was also the, you know, the, the ultimate Supreme Court judge. And one of the things happened is that the people would come to the king to resolve legal disputes, and as the kingdom grew, David didn't formulate lower-level judges to be able to take some of the court work from him. And so what happened is that you had all these small issues that were coming to David, and it was way more than he could handle. And as a result, you had all these people that would come to you know, the, the, uh, the capital to hear their, have their case heard, and David wouldn't get to it. And people would get frustrated, and they would go out way, and they'd be frustrated because of lack of justice. Now, Absalom knew that. Now, if you have your Bibles, go to uh, chapter 15, verse 2, and you look at how he responded. That explains what happens here. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, from what city are you? And when he said, your servant is of such and such a tribe of Israel, Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. And Absalom would say, oh, that I were judge in the land, that it, then every man with a dispute or cause would come to me, and I would give him justice. And so what he's doing is waiting out there for all these people that are waiting, knowing that they're not, all cases aren't going to get heard, and they're all frustrated, and he's saying, well, tell me, well, you know, the problem is that you know, King David just doesn't care about you. He hasn't established judges, and so your case isn't going to get heard. And man, if you had a good king like me... Boy, then justice would be known. You know, I would listen to your, and I, you know, I would listen to your thing, and boy, you're really, your case is right, and I would give you the justice that you would, would need. So then you read in verse 5, so whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. And thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. And so Absalom stole the hearts of men of Israel. And so what happened is that you have people are not only, you know, hearing this, and they go back and they're complaining about the lack of justice with David, He's fermenting that problem, but he's also, they're coming back and saying, boy, we wish we had somebody really good king like his son. And so it says that he stole the hearts of Israel. Now, just even a side note with this, you know, you go back to, you know, truth, you know, wounds that never are, are treated never get better. Do you think that David knew this was happening? It's right outside of his palace. These are people that are waiting to come here, you know, be, come before the king. Some of them probably got before him. There's no way in the world that this happened for four years and David didn't hear about it. And he knows that his son is you know, building this whole uh, fermenting uh, dissatisfaction and a spirit of, of insurrection, and David does nothing. And he just hoped it gets better because he didn't know how to deal with it. And, but as we saw, a wound that goes untreated never gets better by itself. It only gets worse. And so Absalom has this whole plan. And he spends four years building, you know, a name for himself. And then we're not going to read all these verses uh, specifically, but in verses 7 through 15, uh, 12 of chapter 15, he pulls off this coup. And here's basically what happened to sum that up. You know, he tells his dad that he wants to go to the city Hebron to offer this sacrifice. And so he says, well, I'm going to go there. And, and then he invites 200 leading men of Israel, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the, the movers and shakers. And, and, and these men had no idea what his plan was. They were just going because they thought that the son of the king was going to offer a sacrifice, and, and they wanted to support him in that. But then while he was in Hebron, he sent out messengers throughout the land saying that these 200 leaders who had gone with him went with him for the purpose of anointing him king, and so that they had anointed him king. And so suddenly all these people here, and, and this message comes back to David, 
And David's here, you know, boy, Absalom's been made king by all the politically connected people in Jerusalem. They've gone there to help him, which wasn't true. It was all based on a lie, but what happened is he believed it. And so that explains what we see now. If you go to verse 13, you see that, you know, David hears this message and he now panics because he thinks that not only is Absalom, you know, has, has, has been anointed king, but you have all the leaders are with him. These 200 leaders of Jerusalem have gone there and they, every, all the, you know, they're all with Absalom. So verse 13, so a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. And then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, arise and let us flee, or else there'll be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Now, even in that, it's an amazing. Because he says, okay, we got to run, because if we don't, not only is he going to kill us, but he's going he's to kill the whole city. And so the way to save the people of the city is for us to... Now, that says an awful lot about what he thinks about the character of his son, which he has never addressed. And again, ignoring the issue hasn't made it better. It's only made it worse. And so what happens? Verse 16, so the king went out and all his household after him, and the king left 10 concubines to keep the house. And the king went out and all the people after him, and and they halted at the last house. And so here's this picture. You have this king, this aging king at this point in time, and and he gets the word that his son that he loves so dearly has now led this revolt against him, and he believes that all the people are with him. All these leaders are with him. And so he gathers all the people in the palace, and they said, okay, let's need to run. And they start going out of the city of Jerusalem. And literally, it tells us that people line up across, you know, as as they're going, and they're just weeping and wailing because they love this king. The people weren't with Absalom. They they, they love David. And and here he is, you know, all these people, they're going out of here, and, and David is just overwhelmed. And what you see is that there were seeds of compromise of sin that he didn't deal with. There were, now we're growing to harvest. There were a lack of dealing with the wounds that were untreated that didn't get better, they get worse. And now the crisis is coming to bear. But in the midst of that, there's one other thing that we need to remember. We need to remember that although he sinned and although Nathan said that there would be consequences and although these consequences are now coming to to, to fruition just as they were prophesied, when he was confronted, he also confessed And there are promises, there are consequences of his repentance. And the promise of that repentance was that God forgave him and that God offered him grace. Yes, Nathan said there would be consequences of the action. And what we see playing out is exactly what Nathan had prophesied. But after that prophecy, you know, he basically confessed and he agreed with God. Look at what it says in verse 13. Now this is chapter 12, 13, right after the confession. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I agree, I am sin, I am guilty. I ask him to forgive me. And look at the promise. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. You know, you're forgiven. The Lord has put away your sin. You know, you're not gonna die. Not only that, God's going to show his grace towards you. So when we looked at this, we also saw Psalm 32, which was written in this time. And look at what David said he realized about God. What he realized that Nathan was saying to him, the promise that God was making. Verse seven, You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. He's saying, before I hid from you, before I was in shame and I hid from you, and I realized that you always knew there was no purpose in hiding, so instead I ran to you, I asked you to forgive me, and now you are a hiding place for me. And you will preserve me from trouble. Now I want to ask you, does it sound like he is being preserved from trouble in this whole incident? I mean, his kingdom's falling apart. And Nathan said that would happen. So how could he say, you're going to preserve me from trouble when the prophecy said, trouble's coming? And here's why. Because David's point was not that he ever believed that God would save him from going through the trouble. The trouble was prophesied. That was part of the reaping. He knew that was coming. But when he says, you are a hiding place and you will preserve me from trouble, he is saying more, you will preserve me through the trouble that I'm going to face. I know it's coming. But God, you're going to carry me through. That's why it says, you surround me with shouts of deliverance. Hey, listen, the only time you need shouts of deliverance is when you're surrounded by problems. And he says, I know it's going to come, and I know there are going to be times that I need to be delivered. And God, when that trouble comes, you're going to preserve me through the trouble, and you're going to surround me with shouts of deliverance. 
And he understood that he sinned. He understood that there were things that were consequences of those sins. But he realized also that he had God's grace and forgiveness. And with that forgiveness, what it means with grace is, did he deserve some of the consequences? Yes. But God said, I'm going to give you protection. I'm going to give you help that you do not deserve. And you might feel at times, well, God isn't there. Well, I don't deserve God to be there. Well, grace, the whole idea of grace is, of course you don't deserve it. But God doesn't give us grace because we deserve it. He gives us grace because we acknowledge we don't deserve it, and we ask him to forgive us through Jesus, and then he gives us what we do not deserve. And he understood that. But you can understand that and forget it. And when we forget these truths, what happens is that they become powerful lies that have incredible destructive power. And we see this play out, you know, that, you, that there's a power of, of feelings that are propelled by deception that lead our lives into very dangerous places. Now, we've seen already that when we saw that whole story playing out, Absalom has this whole revolution, and it's all based on a deception. It's all based on a lie. Remember, you know, Absalom brought these 200 leaders with him to the sacrifice. But, but again, look at verse 11. If you have your Bibles, 15, 11. It says, when Absalom went with 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited guests, they went in their innocence and knew nothing. These were all pawns. These were being played by Absalom. They weren't supporting him. You see, but Absalom played it well. And, and he sends all these people to the city saying, oh, they, all these people have made me king. It's all a lie. It's all a deception. But David hears the report, and because he knows what Absalom has been doing in the, you know, in the palace there, he believes it. And suddenly he believes that all of Israel has deserted him, and, and suddenly he panics. He believes something wrong, and because he has the wrong belief, he has a, a wrong emotional response, and that emotional response then drives wrong behaviors, foolish behaviors. Now, here's what I want you to realize, that this is something that's not only describing a strategy that Absalom used against David thousands of years ago, it's describing a strategy that Satan used against us today. It's, it's Satan's strategy against us. You see, we're going to face periods of crisis, and, and what happens is Satan tries to make it look like God isn't there, everyone is against us. You know, and, and what happens is then we panic. God, why aren't you here? We get angry at God. God, you've let me down. Or beyond that, he, he lies to us about God. He lies to us and convinces us that God has abandoned us because God doesn't love us. And you're guilty. Do you know all the things that you've done in bad? Why would, would God care for you? In fact, if you want to see this, what we're going to, I mentioned earlier, we're going to spend some time this morning in Psalm chapter 3. In Psalm chapter 3, if you look right there, if you have your Bibles, if you look right in the beginning, what does it say? It's a Psalm of David when he fled Absalom, his son. This was written right in this period of time. It was written within the days that he was actually fleeing from Absalom. And so what you see is something about his thinking. You see his private thoughts. And look at how he starts the psalm. And this is where, this is where he started in this whole when he was running away. Look at uh, verses 1 and 2. Oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him and God. And, and, and here's what's happening. He says, people are accusing me. They're saying, you know, David, you know, you don't, man, you remember all the stuff that you did? You remember you're guilty? How could God take care of you? God has abandoned you. And he then responds to that with incredible strong emotion of panic. And what we see here is something that we do the same thing. We face some kind of stress. We face temptation. And suddenly what happens is that Satan tries to lie to us. And part of that lie is that often, you know, well, God isn't there for you. God's let you down. Everybody's left you, and, you know, how can you believe that God's going to take care of you? Either God's not here, so because he's not here, of course, you know, you're foolish to believe that he'll take care of you when you don't see him. Or a lot of times he loads guilt on us. And he says, but do you remember what you did back then? You know, why would you believe that God would take care of you? Why would you believe that God really loves you? Why would you believe that God values who you are? And so what he does is he lies to us, and that lie leads to wrong emotions, which leads to foolish behavior. And what we need to realize in the midst of that is that what David realized here is, no, I need to reestablish myself in right thinking. So we've got to understand that there's, there's a correlation here between, um, you know, be, between uh, facts, feelings, and behavior. And that one slide was a little messed up there. It's, you know, this correlation between facts, feelings, and behavior. And here's how it works. First of all, we have these wrong beliefs. We have wrong beliefs that create emo powerful emotions, and you see this with David. He had wrong beliefs about, about Absalom, 
You know, everyone's against me. He had wrong beliefs about God. God has turned against me. That's what everybody's telling me. And he forgot the forgiveness. And so he has the wrong beliefs, and those lead to panic. It leads to emotions. And then those powerful emotions then drive foolish decisions and actions. And so a lot of times when we respond, you know, we're responding based on how we feel, but how we feel is based on a lie. And so because I feel let down, because I feel uh, isolated, because I feel lonely, I'm tempted. Because I feel like, you know, that God is, isn't reliable, then, you know, then how can I rely upon him? But then those foolish actions, we do foolish actions, we make bad decisions, and they reinforce the wrong thoughts and beliefs. So I do the wrong thing, and when I do the wrong thing, it kind of reaffirms that, yeah, I'm, you know, what you believed about this is right. See, here's ultimately the problem. When you look at this, here's how, this is how we get in so much uh, mess so often in our lives, is that we have feelings and emotions that drive our lives, and we never sit back and evaluate the beliefs that created those feelings and emotions. And so often we sit there and we're angry and we don't ever think about why we're acting a certain way and we don't think about, okay, well, I'm angry because I didn't forgive this person and, and I had these wrong beliefs about forgiveness which made wrong emotion which is now driving my behavior. I feel guilty, I feel worthless and because I feel worthless and I feel that God couldn't love me, see, I, don't, I make bad decisions because I, don't, I think that's who I am. I see myself as a sinner. But I have wrong beliefs that drive wrong emotions which drive wrong behavior and I never go back and I think, where is it coming from? And what we need to realize is that God wants us to come back and to fight the battle for our soul, realizing that we've got to fight it starting in our thinking. We've got to find God's deliverance, and where do we find his deliverance? We find it in our thinking. Again, we even, you know, I could say, well, how does this play out? We understand this even in simple ideas. You know, you go back into the beginning of Lion King, right? You know, it was wrong thinking that led him to run away and to give up. And, and then, you know, at this moment, at the, you know, there's... A moment, he turns it around, and suddenly he has this, you know, vision which changes his thinking, and, and so if you've ever seen the movie, you remember this, you know, here's this, this vision, and everything changes for, for Simba at this moment because his thinking changes. Simba, you have forgotten me. No, how could I? You have forgotten who you are, and so forgotten me. Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have become. You must take your place in the circle of life. How can I go back? I'm not who I used to be. Remember who you are. You are my son, and the one true king. No, please, don't leave me. Father, don't leave me. Now, if you know the whole story, he remembers who he is, and then he goes back and he takes his place, and, the, and everything's changed because he thinks differently. Now, again, that's fiction, and you, know, and, and, and you look at that and you say, well, that's you know, kind of this whole you know, naturalistic perspective, and God doesn't come to us in clouds and God doesn't say messages. And, but you know what? Even some of that idea is right. It's we need to remember, not who we are. We need to remember who he is. And if I remember who he is, and if I remember his grace and forgiveness, then I know who I am. And if I know who I am, then that changes everything. And you know what? God is unlikely to give you a vision in the clouds like that. You know, usually he uses more mundane means. Sometimes he uses something as boring as a long-winded, bald preacher to tell you these ideas. You know, it just... But the thing is that there's, there's truth here. And the truth is, is that God and his grace are the ultimate foundation of right thinking. It's not remembering us, it's remembering him because that tells us who we are. And remember, you look at David. You know, he first of all responded emotionally because he believed a lie. But then when we see the rest of Psalm 3, when we see the rest of the second half of 2 Samuel 15, we see that he begins to see right. And it starts by, we're going to see in a moment, where he sees the ark. Look at, uh, if you have your Bibles, go to, uh, again, chapter 15, starting in verse 24. We're told that he's, he's going out, and everybody's weeping and crying. Look at what happens. And Abathar came up, and behold, Zodak came also with all the Levites, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God until all the people had passed out of the city. 
And I think when the, the priests came, they brought the ark of God, symbolizing the presence. And I think what they were trying to say, we don't know for sure, but I think part of their idea with the message was they're trying to say, David, we want you to know that God is with you. You know, we believe that you are God's anointed. God sent a prophet to anoint you king. And you know what? You've got Absalom, and he might have people behind him, but he doesn't have God behind him. God hasn't anointed him, and the fact that God hasn't anointed him might mean whatever people he has, he doesn't have God. And we want you to know that we believe that God is with you. And the ark is here because that's a symbol of God's presence that we want you to believe that. Now, I believe that while one of their main messages was to affirm David as king, there was a deeper message that he needed to hear. Because there was a deeper lie that he had forgotten. You see, he had, he had, he had taken, he had ta- or, or he, that he had started to, to, to hear and he had forgotten the truth. He had heard the lie that God wasn't with him. That God had abandoned him. And and that's what you see in the beginning of Psalm 3. But look at verse 3 of Psalm 3. He suddenly realizes, I think at this moment, he's reminded, God is with me. Verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because we just sang it. Okay, that's, if you ever wonder where that verse, your song comes, it's Psalm 3, 3. And here's this incredible song. You know, David has this great moment of shame. He's being escorted out, you know, in, in shame. His son has, has rebelled against him, that his, you know, his, his head is down, he's, he's defeated. And, and you look at that and you say, in the middle of this, he says, now I suddenly realize that you, oh God, are with me. That, that God, I might be attacked, but you are a shield around me. And you are my glory, you are the lifter of my head. My glory isn't based on what I've done, it's based on you. If I look at what I've done, man, I'm, I've failed as a dad, i failed as a king, i failed morally, I deserve this. And, but God, you give me glory based on grace. And it's amazing when you look at this, he's, his emotions are down, he's defeated, he's panicked, but he doesn't come and say, God, what I need is a new emotional high. God, I need an experience because I need an experience. And we often think of that. But what he does is he said, God, what I needed is I needed not a feeling because the feelings will change. I need truth. I need truth about me. And, and, and when you even see here in the Psalms, you know what I love about the Psalms? Is these are truths that were meant to be sung at that time. And that's part of the value of worship. There are times that we sit there and we say, God, I don't feel you. God, I don't see you. I don't believe these truths. That's why there's power in worship. When we surround ourselves with worship music, it's in a sense preaching to ourselves these truths and saying, God, help me to believe these things. He continues, verse 4. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered a prayer from the holy hill. You know, I cried. You know, it's not only that I thought this, but I acted, and I cried out to God. I lay down and slept, and I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I love even what this verse is saying. Because what it's saying is, I look at this, and, I, and all I could do is I could believe God enough to sleep, go to sleep at night, and, and, and believe that I'm not going to get killed overnight. And you know, the next day I woke up, and God was there, and God was taking. And sometimes when we go through this, we're, we're striving for God, and, and He is going to provide for us moment by moment, day by day. That's all that we get sometimes. But He will always be there. Verse 6, I will not be afraid for many thousands of people who set themselves against me all the day long. Now, here's what I want you to realize. He, he doesn't say, I'm, I'm going to feel better when people do this. He doesn't say, I don't have any fear. Look what he says. I will not be afraid. That's a volitional action or statement. That's not saying, I don't have fear. It's saying, I will make a decision not to be afraid. Now, why is it? You say, I'm surrounded by all these enemies. And you know, if you're surrounded by enemies, will you have fear? Yes. It's not natural to not be afraid when you're surrounded by all those enemies. But he's saying, when I have reason to fear, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to realize that I'm not going to be controlled by my fear. I'm not going to let my emotions drive my actions. Instead, I'm going to fight a battle where I'm going to say, God, help me to think right. And as I think right, that will reshape my emotions and that will drive my actions. You see, what we see here is a basic idea that a renewed mind results from an intentional decision. That a lot of times, when we fight these battles, it isn't just that we, we wait until God somehow changes us. There's a battle that we have to fight. Romans chapter 12 talks about this, that we need to renew, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's something we have to do. Why is it there's so many times that the Bible tells us to think? Because it's an intentional decision to claim these things. 
And he made these beliefs, and it's evident now if you go back to 2 Samuel 15, because he then acts differently. When he thought differently, he felt differently, and he acted differently. Look at uh, 2, chapter, uh, 2 Samuel 15, 25. Then the king said to Zodak, carry the ark back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let uh, me see both it and the dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, I'm here and let him do whatever it seems good to me. Now, here's what's happening. Is that he's looking at this and the, and the people who are bringing the ark, not only saying, we want to know that God is with you, but if David, if you bring the ark, then people will see that you have God with you and they'll rally around you because you have the symbolism of the ark. And what he realizes is that he sees the ark and it reminds him of God. And he realizes what I need isn't God's symbolism. What I need is God. I need his presence. And you know what? If I have his presence, I don't need the symbol. I have him. And that's what he's saying in Psalm 3. I have God. I have a relationship. No, he hasn't abandoned me. He's forgiven me. And by his grace, he's my protector now. He's going to lift me up. He's the one in whom I find my hiding place. He's the one in whom I find deliverance because God is with me. And he makes this intentional decision. And because he makes that decision, he now acts. And he says, well, I'm going to send the ark back. I don't need it. And you see then in the rest of chapter 15, he acts. He starts to take charge again. And he starts a strategy that will eventually lead to the overflow of Abs or overthrow of Absalom. Because when you believe right, and then you act right, and it changes our feelings. See, there's again, there's a correlation between facts, feelings, and behaviors. There's a natural one. And the natural one is we believe wrong and then we feel a certain way and then we act wrongly. But a God transformed one, it says, no, that what we need to do is that we need to realize that there's a, a turning that around. That we've got to realize that we have this thing called faith. And the question is, where do you put your faith in what you feel or what you know? Look what James says about this in James chapter one. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to, to all without finding reproach and it will be given. If we struggle, go to God and ask, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person will not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all, all his ways. And here's what he's saying. A lot of times we can go in crisis, and if we ask, and if it's based on our emotion, if we put our faith on what we think and what we feel and what we see, you know, when things are good, we're going to say, okay, God's good because things are really good, and then things are bad. God's not, you know, we're like the wave. We're in and out depending on circumstances. And he says, no, fix your faith in what you know to be true. Fix your faith in what you know to be true, not what you feel to be true. See, that's the challenge, is that we start by confronting powerful emotions with right thinking. Are there times that we're overwhelmed? Yes. Are there times that you're fearful? Yes. Are there times that you're you know, and despondent? Yes. Are there times that you can't understand God? Yes. We will all go through that. But the question is, are you going to confront those emotions with right thinking? Are you going to say, God, help me to remember who you are. Help me to remember who you, know, who you have, your grace for me. Help me to remember and to think right. And to confront that with right thinking, because then right thinking will drive wise decisions and right actions. And so when we think right, there might be times that we don't feel like doing something. But because we know it's right, you say, God, I'm going to do what I know what's right. I'm going to choose to fix my faith on what I know, not what I feel. And so I'm going to choose to do that, and I'm going to choose to act based on knowledge, even though it sometimes it doesn't feel right. Because what happens is when I think right, and then I make right decisions, in time, that will reshape our emotions. So in time, that will then allow our faith to be rooted in what we know, and in times, that will change what we feel. So, but just the closing question in that is this. Do we base our faith on what we know to be true or what we feel? And what God says or what we see? Do we believe our feelings or do we believe God's truth? And my friends, we will all go through this battle because there will be numerous times in our life what we see and what we feel seems to be way more true than what God says because we don't see it and we don't feel it. And, but the battle that God calls us to is to, to fight a battle of our mind, of recognizing that if we don't, it will lead us, wrong ideas will lead us to wrong emotions, it will lead us to really foolish decisions. And, and the battle that we have to fight is, God, help me to remember you. Help me to remember the ark. Help me to re remember your presence. Help me to remember your grace so that I think right. And, and then I make right decisions and my, my emotions will change because when I base my faith on what I know, not what I feel, it will change my life in a way that is way more positive than we could ever dream.
Thanks for watching. If you have any questions about what we talked about, Jesus Christ or church, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, or by email. The links are in the description.